Susan Adams disappeared from Idaho 30 years ago. A case rarely spoken of, how did she vanish on a trip with her husband and tour guides without leaving any clues? I recently came across this case that I had never heard of and realized the case is almost never talked about. I couldn't find a single mention of this case on this sub at all and there are very few articles written about it. Susan Adams, 42 and her husband Tom both enjoyed the outdoors and venturing around on trips. They had spent months research and planning a trip near the Idaho slash Montana border, where they had paid and arranged for a tour company to help them explore the wilderness there. They met with tour guides who took them to the base camp. Because Susan wasn't as adventurous, the plan was for her husband and a tour guide to take an overnight hunting trip further into the wilderness, while Susan would remain at base camp. On September 30, 1990, Susan reportedly told the chef at base camp that she was going to do a short hike to a nearby meadow so she could bird watch. Her husband Tom arrived back from his hunting trip later that day and learned Susan had taken a short hike to bird watch, however as evening approached he became worried when she didn't return and decided to hike to the meadow to find her. Tom stated he hiked towards the meadow and followed her footprints, however just before the meadow her footprints abruptly ended, as if she had suddenly vanished at that point. Tom and the tour guide searched for Susan into the night, but found no trace of her. The next morning one of the guides rode a horse back to town to alert police. Police made a number of search attempts, but other than some prints that may have been from her, they did not find her or any of her belongings or clothing. Several theories have been presented, the first being that she simply became lost or injured, however some discount this because of the sudden end of footprints, the fact that a major search of the area was conducted and the fact that she was simply walking to a meadow to watch birds not going off on a long dangerous hike. Second, some point to the chef at base camp, the last person known to see her who claimed Susan told him she was going to the meadow to bird watch, some speculate he may have harmed her and then disposed of the body elsewhere, which is why nothing of hers was found in the meadow. Third, some point to her husband, saying that perhaps he found her in the meadow still burn watching when he went searching for her, got into an altercation and killed her there. Although many discount that for a lack of any real motive and no evidence of an attack. Lastly, some speculate that a wild animal attacked her or even that aliens kidnapped her. While a wildlife attack could have certainly occurred, some say it is odd that an attack like that would occur in the middle of the day near an open meadow with no signs of any attack. So what do you all think? Which theory do you think holds the most water? Resolved, Timothy Edward Robinson, missing since November 27, 2008. I haven't seen anyone post this yet, so I thought I'd let you know there's been another resolution to a missing person case. This time it was Timothy Edward Robinson who went missing in Oregon on November 27, 2008. Mr. Robinson did leave a suicide note behind when he went missing saying that he was going to drive off a boat dock. On May 26, 2020. The YouTube channel Adventures with Purpose was doing a live stream of an environmental cleanup dive to pull cars out of the Willamette River at the Jefferson Street boat ramp in Milwaukee, Oregon. Unfortunately, when they got their first car, a silver Mazda 6, up out of the water and onto the boat ramp, human remains were found in the vehicle. Jared Lysak, the host of the channel, immediately put a stop to the live stream and police were contacted. The video was also edited to put a blur over the remains to respect the dead. Today. A new video was posted to the channel confirming the finding of Mr. Robinson and showing the edited video of the recovery. Mr. Robinson's remains were treated with respect and hidden from view of the camera as much as possible. This is not the first time Mr. Lysak has been able to assist in the finding and recovery of missing persons lost underwater as he also helped bring closure to the family of Nathan Ashby in Missouri last December after being contacted by Mr. Ashby's family. German suspect and Madeleine McCann case now also linked to murdered teenager in 1996 in Belgium. In the Belgian news a new story broke this evening. Christian B., the German suspect in the Madeleine McCann case is also linked to the unsolved murder of Carola Titsa. Thought it might be good to have a separate post to dick sus this case. The facts, Carol Titsa, a 16-year-old girl from Bremen, Germany is on holiday with her parents in Dahan at the seaside in Belgium. On June 28, 1996 Carol is last seen when she went swimming with a friend. When she's not home the next day, her parents alert the police and a big search action is launched. Her mutilated body is found on July 11, only a couple of yards from the camping where she was staying. During the investigation, police discovers that she spent a lot of time with an unknown German boy. The two of them were last seen in a local disco. The unknown German boy becomes their main suspect and the police try to find him spreading a robot picture, included in the links below. Together with the German police, a massive search was launched but they never found him, nor did he come forward. In 2016, the case was closed due to lack of new leads. 
What do we know about this suspect? Estimated age between 17 to 19 years old. Blonde hair. German, speaking with an Eastern German accent. Claimed to have spent time in juvenile detention and that he was visiting Belgium with a probation officer, witnesses claimed he told Carola this in the days leading up to her disappearance. Why Christian B could be a match. In 1996, he would be 19 years old, fitting the profile. He's originally from Bavaria, so not in Eastern Germany, but we don't know who claimed this accent. According to the Telegraph, his first conviction was in 1994, so he could have been in juvenile detention. The local authorities in Brugge are reopening the case and will be working with the German police again on this case. What do you think? I must admit, he looks like he's fitting the profile. It's just chilling to me that if he committed such atrocities at such a young age, who knows how many victims he made all throughout Europe in hit past 25 years. He's also being linked to the disappearance of Inca, the rape of a 72-year-old woman in Portugal and he's currently in jail for other crimes as well. In July of 1995, the body of 29-year-old Indianapolis resident and mother of two, Joanna Weaver, was found in a wheel rut near I-70. She had been stabbed multiple times, and her body had been burned. Now nearly 25 years later her case remains unsolved. 29-year-old Joanna Weaver definitely lived a high-risk lifestyle. The Indianapolis mother of two had developed a crack cocaine addiction that eventually led her to occasionally using prostitution as a way to pay for her habit. Joanna attempted to shield her two young children, ages 6 and 8, from her double life as much as she could. Joanna was considered a semi-functioning addict. During the week, she worked as a cashier at a local fast food restaurant. However, on weekends Joanna would drop her kids off with their grandmother if she planned to engage in any unsavory activities. The normal routine would be for Joanna to drop the kids off Friday evening and pick them up on Sunday. Joanna's mother, Johnny Huddleston, had taken her daughter to rehab several times, but Joanna would always leave before completing the program. The weekend of June 30, 1995, Joanna dropped her kids off with her mother as usual and left. When Sunday rolled around and Joanna didn't show up, Johnny grew concerned. She claimed that even though Joanna was an addict, it was unlike her to not come get her kids on time. For the next week, Johnny received several voicemails from her daughter. She said the voicemails caused her to fear for her daughter's safety, not because of anything specific Joanna had said, but because of the tone of her voice. She said Joanna sounded quiet and scared. She also said the timing of the calls were strange. The voicemails Joanna left would always be when Johnny was at work. When she would try to call Joanna back, she wouldn't get an answer. Due to the voicemails, police could not immediately file a missing persons report on Joanna, as she had made contact with her mom. Johnny doesn't know what day for sure, but suddenly, the voicemails stopped. Then on July 13, around 8 a.m., a mowing crew cutting the grass in the median near East 13th and Lewis Street beneath the north split of I-70, found a body in a wheel rut covered with debris. The badly decomposed body was identified on July 21 as Joanna. The autopsy determined Joanna had been stabbed multiple times, and then set on fire. DNA was also collected from Joanna's body that police believe is that of her killer. They also found the knife used to stab Joanna next to her body. The last possible sighting of Joanna was on July 8, near 17th and Park Street. Acquaintances of Joanna's claim that evening they saw her with a man they didn't recognize. Joanna would frequent the area to pick up dates and score drugs. People who ran in the same circles as Joanna remained tight-lipped about the murder. Police questioned multiple people, but most had nothing to say, in the fear of being viewed as a snitch. Joanna's daughter hopes that after all this time, maybe someone will finally be brave enough to come forward with information on her mom's murder. Albert Cooper three missing seven years disappeared without a trace. The Avonmore area man was last seen leaving a convenience store early on the morning of June 6, 2013. Then he vanished. An investigator said the case is unusual because there is no sign of foul play nor is there proof that Copper willingly left. Despite a continuing search, he hasn't been seen at a gas station or restaurant. His credit card and social security numbers haven't been used. Next month, Cooper will turn 32. Text taken from a news website Albert Cooper. His family is still searching for him and would love to have this case reach more eyes. Not sure that anything can really be done but the more eyes that are on this the better. What happened to the Bangladeshi American who was looking for his kids who were taken by his wife who joined ISIS? In short, after he moved to America with his wife, the wife went too deep on the internet and turned radical. She started hating the Western culture and made her mind to leave US ASAP. Knowing that her husband wouldn't agree with her, she flew away with her son and daughter to Syria.
After several requests made by the father to the FBI, they finally found a lead in Syria. He went there with the vice team where he learned that his wife got killed in a drone strike by U.S. but several women said that his kids were alive. As the ISIS has left the area, the members of the caliphate now live in enormous clusters of makeshift tents where it's extremely difficult to find a specific person let alone two kids with no parents. Until the making of the documentary, he didn't find his kids. Four days after 20-year-old IU student Joseph Smedley was reported missing, his body was found in Lake Griffey a few miles from campus. He was wearing a backpack filled with 60 pounds of rocks. His death was ruled a suicide, but his family and friends are determined to prove otherwise. On Monday, September 28, 2015, 20-year-old Joseph Smedley, a sophomore at Indiana University, was reported missing by his family after his sister, Vivian, received a strange text message from Joseph's phone at 4 a.m. The text, which can be read here, says, Viv, I love you. I am leaving the country. By not telling you why, I'm keeping you safe and protected. Please don't try to contact me at this number, it won't work. I'll contact you once I'm set up overseas. Thank you for everything Viv, I love you. And I'm sorry. Concerned, Vivian called Indiana University Police to conduct a wellness check, but they could not locate Jaspa. A note was found on his bed at the frat house saying the same thing the text sent to Vivian had said. Later on, Vivian said the police called her claiming to have found her brother in jail, but she says it turned out to be a different person with a similar name. Shortly after the mix-up, Police classified Joseph as a missing person. The last people that were known to see Joseph alive were his fraternity brothers in the Sigma Pi fraternity. Jospa had only recently moved into the frat house a few days prior to his disappearance. They said the last time they saw Joseph was around 11.30 p.m. on Sunday evening. On Friday, October 2, his body was found in Griffey Lake, a few miles from campus. Joseph was floating in three feet of water and had a backpack strapped to his chest containing approximately 60 pounds of rocks. He was also found wearing a pair of binoculars that his sister believes was to view the blood moon that had happened the evening he had went missing. On December 5, the Monroe County coroner officially ruled the death a suicide by drowning. Joseph's family and friends do not believe that Joseph killed himself. They paid for a third-party agency to perform another autopsy. According to them, the autopsy revealed that Joseph had bruises consistent with someone holding him down. Joseph's friends and family also claim he had made plans before his disappearance. Vivian said her brother had promised to take care of something for her Monday morning and that he had invited a female friend to hang out that upcoming Thursday. Investigators gave a copy of the note found on Joseph's bed to his sister to confirm it was his handwriting. Vivian said it was not her brother's handwriting. Phone records show that just after the strange 4 a.m. text was sent. Joseph's phone was turned off. It was determined that Jospa was at 7th and Walnut Street when the text was sent. Jospa's car wasn't running at the time of his disappearance and his sister doubts he would have walked the three miles to where his body was found. She believes, at the very least, someone gave him a ride. A series of tweets on Joseph's Twitter page, has caused others to develop their own theories about what may have taken place that night, including the possibility of a police cover-up. Currently, there has been no new information nor any leads about the case, which police have marked as inactive. Mr. Smedley's cause of death was determined to be drowning by the Monroe County Coroner's Office and the manner of death was determined to be suicide, said Public Information Officer for Bloomington Police, Ryan Pettigo. There is no further investigation being completed in that case. Vivian has hired private investigators and has created a Facebook page for her brother called Justice for Joseph. She has also started a petition to have Jospa's death ruled a homicide. Vivian has hired private investigators and has created a Facebook page for her brother called Justice for Joseph. She has also started a petition to have Jospa's death ruled a homicide. Vivian claims the investigation has been stalled multiple times because police refused to release vital information to her. She said that the police gave all of the information they collected to Joseph's estranged father, who signed his rights to Joseph away when he was young, and had no part in his life. Only when Vivian and Joseph's mother signed her power of attorney over to Vivian, was she finally able to continue to investigate. She says, I really hope that somebody realizes that this is a whole life. You know people go through college and they just meet a lot of people and they think this is just a person, but it's not. He had a whole life and a family. And a huge amount of friends and impacted so many people in the community more than anybody realized.